do announcements at the end. Before I get started with my talk, I wanted to see if we have any first time visitors today. So if you're here for the very first time, please allow us to love on you. And we have a brochure, visitor's packet, I think that uh, Maureen will get for you. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're, we're really delighted that you're here. And for those of you, yes, thank you. And for those of you who are regular folks, you know, sometimes it's nice to feel like you're here for the very first time in a different kind of way. It opens you up to beginner mind. It can open you up to possibilities and new ways of doing things. Because sometimes we get into a routine and, and things are like, okay, this is what I do and, and such. But to me, it calls us to be even more present with where we are, what we notice, and how we create our experience. And really, that's what today is about in so far as how we create our experience. Is it one in faith? Is it one in fear? Sydney spoke about fearless living last Sunday and how we navigate that journey. I remember the first time I heard the phrase, fake it till you make it. And that's very popular, actually, especially in the law of attraction, new thought circles. And at first it was like, here I am trying to live authentically, right? And I want to be me, and learning what that is, not really being sure. And then everybody's like, yeah, you know, you just fake it until you make it, and eventually you'll get there. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. So I, I tried to embrace that for a while. And it just didn't fit for me. And I was like, okay. But if it fits for you, that's okay. So please know that too. Because to me, faith, or living your life and creating your experience, is about what resonates with you. It's about what you believe in. It's about what your energy is invested in. We're like you know, a bank account to where we have this energy. And we deposit it and we put it in places so that ideally, hopefully, we get a return. And that return is always there, but it's very, um, it's incumbent upon us to really notice where are we placing our energy? Is it coming from a place of fear? What kind of return will that yield you? I think you already know. And when, if you, if you reflected back on your life today, we went around and we shared a story about a time in your life when you were anchored in the faith. I bet that would be a time that you probably felt empowered or enriched or really so close to God that the oneness of all that you are was so palpable and so present, you knew that the illusion of separation was no longer your experience because you were one with all that is. So to me, that caused you to look at what is it that you believe you are? To be open to the songs we've been singing today and everything is about this energy. I can feel it now. I don't know about you all. That's just streaming through here. And it's that ineffable that's just a wonderful word, this ineffable experience of God, of love. It's just so nice to allow yourself to be immersed in it. How many years ago? 1972. I had an experience in my life. And my upbringing was a mix of Russian Orthodox with my mom and fundamental Baptist with my dad. And so it was quite the mix. But what I learned was, you know, a God up there that I pray to, I beg, I get down on my knees, and I do all these things to say, please help me, please make this happen, please make that happen. And if I'm true, and if I'm faithful to God, the God out there, then, you know, certain things will happen if I just toe the line. And that was pretty much what I learned. And... I was 20 years old at the time, and my dad, he had some PTSD and some things left over from World War II. So he really struggled with mental health issues. And he kind of had a pretty, a pretty uh, intense experience, a big, back then they called it a nervous breakdown, okay? And all of a sudden he was like, okay, I need to take off and go find his mother, who was in Texas at the time, we were here in Georgia. And so he was like, okay, I just have to go. And all these other things were happening to him mentally, 
his health was really deteriorating, and I didn't know what to do. And I pretty much had always been a caregiver for my mom. I was almost like a reverse parent for her when I was growing up. So I kind of took on that role with my dad as well. So anyway, he took off to Texas, and so I was trying to finish up a couple of courses in college here at Kennesaw Junior at the time. And I was like, I didn't know what to do. I really didn't know what to do. I was trying to get on with my life and hear this was happening, but I could tell that my mom was in a place of really not having a clue what she needed to do. My mom had never worked, except when she was living in China where she was born, until she met my dad, about 25 years old, in China during World War II, but she had never worked. My dad really never wanted her to work. So my mom was very dependent upon my father. And of course, what I saw was this figurehead, you know, the patriarchal dad, and here we are as a family, and we just kind of do what it is we're supposed to do. So here I was in this position of trying to figure out. And all I could rely on at that time, and that's why I know for me my roots are anchored in God, and sometimes I will tell you, beseeching prayer, I'm all over it. Because there are times when, okay, Jeannie, you know, act as if, faith it till you make it, here I am doing the talk today, right? And it's like, no! God, I need your help now. I don't know what to do, please. And I'm down on my knees because that's the place in which, you know what, for me, I finally let it go. I say, I don't have a clue anymore. I surrender because I don't have a clue. But back then, I didn't know that. I was like, help me. So ultimately, got my mom in the car, we moved. To Austin, Texas. And my dad was pretty much just going off the deep end, I guess is a good way to put it. I don't know truly how he made it out to Texas. And so we moved into this house, and all these things started happening. I could make this really long story even longer, but I'll try to keep it very brief. Because what I want you to know is each and every one of us have that time, and several times I know on this journey, when stuff happens and we are standing there clueless not knowing what to do at all. And the strangest things started happening when we moved in. The realtor happened to be uh, one of the deacons or something of this little bitty Baptist church in Austin, Texas. We're getting get this now back in 1972 in Texas in this little bitty Baptist church. And I think it was called Harvest something, if I'm not mistaken. And so I went to this church because I had been connected with Rossell Street Baptist Church here in Marietta years ago when I was in high school and when I lived my double life. And I will show you a picture sometime and you'll go, Jeannie, that's you in drag. That's what you'll say. Okay? Prom pictures, everything, because I had to live a double life in order to get through. Okay? So anyway, we were at this church and I'm like, you know, trying to get connected to somebody that can help me because that's all I knew preacher and minister, but the realtor introduced us to this church. So my mom and I would go, and my dad was kind of wandering around Austin, and then he would come home, and then he really went kind of over the deep end even more so, and he would start get out the backyard, and he would start pacing, and he would start grabbing things, and basically what happened is, uh, it was on a, and then he had his mother move in with us, so we got it, my mom, my dad, me, and my grandmother. And I never knew my grandmother. This is really like the first time when she was, what, 80-something at the time? It was quite the story. So anyway, my dad, you know, would say, I'm tired of living. I'm retired with the Air Force. I'm not paying any more bills. And he would rip up the bills that my mom was trying to pay. It was like something out of a book, truly, to be a movie on TV. So one night, he was really badgering my mom, and I thought he was going to you know, beat her up or whatever. So I went up to him, and I confronted him. Well, we got into it, and we were rolling around on the floor. My dad and I, we were fighting. And finally, he took off and ran out of the house. Prior to that, he had been chasing my grandmother around with a knife, and that was a few weeks prior. So all these weird things were happening. So anyhow, he ended up leaving, and it was wintertime in Austin. It can kind of get cold there, I believe it. He disappeared. So there I was, and my mom, remember, she had never really taken care of anything. She had been solely dependent upon my father. So all I knew, and this is a part about faith in action. I think it's in, in James where it says, faith without works is dead. So when we say we have faith, sometimes we sit around and we wait for faith to land upon us rather than us doing something. 
And yes, I'm all about sometimes we need to be still and just allow. I get that, and I believe in that as well. But there are times when you have to say, I am doing something here. And you do whatever it is. That's like, what? You take the step, even though you can't see the whole staircase. Martin Luther King Jr. You take that step anyway. And back then, I didn't even know there was a staircase. So I was making phone calls. The state of Texas trying to get into, and you can imagine, the mental health system at that time. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. How many of you saw that movie? That was a facility that my dad ended up in. I promise you, I swear, they taped it there. Because what happened was, I would call the police department for three days straight every day. Have you picked up my dad? And I would describe him, and every day it was no. And then one day, it was yes. So we went down to the mental health, Boston State Hospital. And like I said, it truly is like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. And here was my dad, and they brought him out for us to visit with him. Like I said, I'm skipping a lot of the details. They tell him he had handcuffs on, and they said he had resisted the police. They had found him wandering through apartment buildings, not too far from where we lived, walking in to people's homes and apartments looking for his mother. He totally was out of it. So prior to that, he had gone through the kitchen, and when my mom and I were not there, had thrown out all the groceries, all the dishes, everything. Everything was gone in there. And so we didn't have any money. And I can't remember what day it was, but it was somewhere in there that all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. And my mom was upset, I was upset, still trying to figure out what to do. It was some church ladies from some local church, you know, and normally I would say, no, we're fine. But you know what? This time I said, can we help you? Is there something? I said, yes, 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 yes. Please come in. And they came in and they prayed the beseeching prayers. They prayed all the stuff that a lot of us have learned early on. And they said, what can we do for you? And I said, we need food. We need groceries. My dad got rid of everything. So little things started happening. And then, like I said, when he went to see my dad, here he was, kind of beaten up and roughed up. And he looked at me, and he pointed the finger at me, and he said, you're the reason I'm in here. Okay? You're the reason I'm in here. If you hadn't done blah, 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 I would never be here. So needless to say, I did not go visit my dad anymore. I would drive my mom and leave her there. But day in and day out, what I'm trying to say if I wasn't faking it till I made it. I was truly faithing it. One day at a time, what could I do? What could I do? And I ended up going, uh, my mom and I actually, when my dad left the house, we weren't sure about our safety, so we went and stayed at a downtown hotel in, in the heart of, of Boston because we really weren't sure if our lives were, you know, <laughs> going to end because we would never know what was going to happen. And Throughout that experience, as my dad, he was in the state hospital for several months, and my mom, once again, had never worked before. Well, she met some of the people at the hospital where my dad was. She ended up getting her very first job in the food service, in the cafeteria. My mom was a brilliant, brilliant woman. She taught herself how to speak English. She could speak five languages, but she never believed in herself. So she goes, well, this is what I can do. This is what I can do. And that was the beginning of a whole new life. My mom was about 50 at the time, beginning of a whole new life. So little by little, and I was like, okay, okay. And then it was just one piece after another that things just kept happening. And you could see God in action showing up in ways that allowed me to know, yes, in those moments we truly do need to surrender. I know Sidney Lou Harrington sings one of my favorite songs, Heme Aquí, and it's sung in Spanish, and it's, Here I am, Lord. Do with me what you will. Do with me what you will. When I was living in the Philippines, I was really little. We moved there when I was four or five. And I don't remember going to vacation Bible school, but apparently I did. 
I don't remember a lot of things in my childhood because I know the, Lord, the uh, 23rd Psalm like it's been embedded in my memory. So for me, at times, whether it's the Lord's Prayer that I find myself immersing myself in, the Beloved, that energy so that I can take that next step. For Cheryl to know what to do, for Debbie to know what to do with Bambi, for all of us to know what do I do in those moments when I don't have a clue and when my heart and soul is feeling like it's being pulled apart in a million different directions. What do I do? Your faith. I look at it like to focus our attention into the heart. Because when we go up here, we can talk ourselves out of all kinds of things, is what I believe. So it's bringing our attention back to that place of love, where I feel all of our answers are, and to know what is that next step that I need to take. What is the next thing that will get me there? <clears throat> There were a couple of thoughts that I came across when I was looking up faith, and we all have different ways that we perceive that, different ways that we understand that. So faith is not about belief. Faith, in fact, has very little to do with what beliefs you hold, other than it allows you to hold them. So it's almost like a container in which to hold that which it is that you listen to or you hear at those moments what it is that that resonates with you. This is where beliefs come into the definition of faith. Faith does not equate to beliefs, but it is possible to hold faith in some of your beliefs. We can have faith in or sacred trust in beliefs, in principles, in people, in religious traditions, in community, like here, you have faith in your community? What, what, and what does that mean to you? When you really open it up and look at it, what does that mean to you? We can have faith in systems and in institutions and ourselves and in the universe as a whole. So where is your attention focused insofar as what you have faith in, what you trust in, what you allow yourself to surrender into and know that in that place, you are truly loved, that you were truly held, like love on faith. I love that song. It gave me goosebumps the whole time. We were singing it and just the energy of it. And that's what it is, folks. It's that energy that infuses us for us to be held in faith. It's like the universe having faith in us, knowing that we will be open to the guidance. I don't get God bumps right now. Knowing that we will be open to being that channel and allowing that to come through. Faith is a sacred, deep, emotionally involved kind of trust. Faith is a kind of trust that you enter into with your whole being. Isn't that nice? I'm shaking this With your whole being. Sometimes that's not so easy. Because I think we can, for a moment, we're there, and then parts of us are there, and then it's like, okay, I'm there. I'm in that pool of faith. I'm being bathed in it. And in that place, the reading that Renee did, this is why this reading spoke to me so powerfully. In the woods, we return to reason and faith. There I feel that nothing, no thing, can befall me in life. No disgrace, no calamity, leaving me my eyes, which nature cannot repair. Standing on the bare ground, my head bathed by the blithe air, and uplifted into infinite space, all egotism vanishes. My humanness. I become a transparent eyeball. That was in my prayer earlier to where I see, and it sees me, and we are one. I am nothing. I am no thing. I am. That is the I am. That's the faith. I see all. 
the currents of the universal being of God, if you will, circulate through me, and I am part or particle of God. When we are in that place, we are faith. We are faith in action expressing. I love the story, and I'm sure you're all familiar with it. And it's so interesting with all the floods that are happening in Texas and other places where there are some, there's some floods happening and the river's rising and the rescue people are coming and knocking on the door and they're letting people know that the water's rising and they need to evacuate. And the people say, no, 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 we're fine. You know, God's going to take care of us. God's going to watch over us. So the waters get a little higher and higher and higher. And, and finally, you know, the only way to access the home is with a boat. So people show up in a boat, and they're like, okay, guys, you need to get on the boat because, you know, you're going to drown. So come on. They're like, no, 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 no. We're fine. God's, God's going to take care of us. And this is like, okay, you sure? Yeah, we're sure. So pretty soon they're on top of the house. The water keeps rising. Does this feel familiar? Yeah. Okay. And there's a helicopter, right? And they're like, okay, you know, the house is going under. Come on, let us, let us help you. Let us save you. And they're like, no. God's got it. We're good. So, well, we know what happens. And so they're in heaven. And they're talking to God, going, God, how could you forsake me? You know, where were you when I needed you? And God goes, really? I sent you people knocking on your door saying, come on. And you said no. And then I sent you a boat. And you wouldn't get in the boat. And I sent you, sent you a helicopter. And you're like, well, I got it. <sighs> Guess what? Taking that next step. Allowing the universe to be there for you. Whatever it takes. And sometimes it takes us dropping down on our knees and saying, I don't know. I don't know. That's, to me, faithing it till you make it. Being able to take that step. And it doesn't mean you have to take the step and say, okay, did I make the right step? The universe says, I am here for you. God says, here, let me uplift you. Part of the divine plan, part of your contract, your agreement. Like in Cindy's prayers today, wherever we are, whatever is going on, we are never alone. But in our humanness, you better believe it can certainly feel like it. So you faith it till you make it. Like I said earlier, perhaps it's time for a faith lift. It's almost like I have a list when I say that. But it's time for a faith lift. See, Asha's even, even say it with me. Faith lift. Faith lift. Can you get it out? Think about it. Maybe it's time for a spiritual what? Faith lift. Yes. Because maybe... You know, some things have kind of gotten a little distorted or a little sagging. Maybe your faith is sagging. Maybe you've got some wrinkles in your faith. You know, I don't know. Maybe you need a, some kind of a lift somewhere. Maybe things need to be smoothed out with spirit. So we're called, I love that smile on your face, Sandy. So we're called to really look at what does lift us up. What are the things that connect you? That's why Emerson's essay, Nature. Cheryl and I had the blessing last night and the joy. I mean, I, my, my birthday was Friday. I turned 63, and I'm so excited. I love being in the 60s. It's great. Well, I love being in the 60s back then, too. Isn't that funny? <laughs> but but uh, we've been taking a lot of classes and everything and, and as shamans uh, with Don Simmons, but I think you've heard of Gentle Thunder. She's been around playing. She does ha uh, hand hammer dulcimer and all these Native American flutes. So Dawn had requested for her to do a personal journey for the shamans. So last night there were about 18 of us in this room over at the Phoenix and Drag in a separate room, and we went on this amazing journey. Oh my goodness. So many flutes and just spirit, just ever present. And all the sounds and the energy was just delicious. Just delicious. That's what I'm talking about. I know for me and I know for Cheryl, we came away with, with a different experience. And I felt so connected. And to me, that's the word. What connects you to the ground of all being? What feeds you? 
Perhaps you already know what it is. Perhaps it is time to really take a look at your life. Take a look at your face of God. Your faith of God. Is it time for that faith left? So that you can say, hey, you know what? This is going on. I know what to do. I'm going to faith it till I make it. I know what steps I need to take because I've been practicing them. And I know what's going to work. Maybe I need to call Sydney or I need to ask for a prayer when I come here. Maybe I can go to Asha when I come here and say, Asha, there's a certain song that you sing and it means so much to me. Maybe it's knowing that, yeah, my, my daughters are in, in Florida or on the beach somewhere having a great time and, and enjoying your, your apparel, right? Maybe that allows you to feel like you have faith that they'll bring your clothes back, right? <laughs> But I know for me right now, I just want to say, uh, Cheryl, with her prayer request, it is a time for faith in every single moment. And I know the challenges that we've had that at times, and I think a, a couple weeks ago when I told you, sometimes I really struggled. And I know I kind of got a little emotional teary a couple weeks ago because it just feels so hard sometimes. But I can tell you today, it's almost like having had a spiritual faith lift. And last week at the uh, Awakened Spirit Expo, by the way, we had a wonderful presence there as a community. And it was a nice time afterward to share and, and support one another in uplifting each other in faith. So you all know this prayer, I believe, the serenity prayer. Does everybody know that? I'm going to invite you to say that with me, if you will, as I close the talk this morning. It's one of my favorites. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Sometimes just a prayer or a mantra. In an instant. It's like touching of the garment. When Jesus walked, all they had to do, instant, your faith is restored. So be mindful, be aware. Pay attention to all that is around you. And if you find yourself standing on the top of that house and, and the water's rising, I really encourage you to get on a helicopter. <laughs> okay? Thank you all so much.